there are all these pain points that customers go, this is what we hate about the industry and we want to go, it does not have to be this way. Right, well, let's kick straight into it. Welcome to the Science of Advertising show. And today we have a very special edition. This is our first of a new series. So it's going to be behind the brand. It's an exclusive look behind the scenes with Australia's fastest growing brands. And today I am super excited because we've got one of our clients, uh, Athena Home Loans, and we've got the amazing Natalie Dinsdale, and we've got Greg Logan from Narrativity. So guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. So I am super keen to dig into both your journey, where you've come from, and also some of the challenges you face, but where we are right now and some of the work you're really excited about. So we'll talk brand, but we'll also talk advertising as well. So my first question that just jumps out is, when you first started working with Athena, what was your first impression of the brand? Like, what were you stepping into, Nat? Well, um, I was really lucky that I was employee number eight. Um, so, and when I first met the guys, I said to them quite upfrontly, look, I'm not your traditional corporate girl. So if you want to do something really conservative and say me, I'm not the person for you. And I, I was a little bit nervous when I first met them because they were all ex nab so I was like, let's just get this straight out the bat because I don't want to waste anyone's time. And they were, I was so excited. They were like, no, 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 that's what we want. We don't want to be samey either. So um, although they had like a, a logo at that time, they just had that for to have something. And they said to me, it's all up for grabs. We want someone like you wow. to come on board and drive the process to get to something differentiated. And I, I was just like, oh my God, that is like music to my ears. Um, so it's like, okay, I'm not sure you know exactly what you're getting into because I don't mean just like a little bit different, a little bit edgy. I'm, I'm talking polar opposite to the backs. So I think they were like, okay, <laughs> come on board. And, um, I do have quite a, a distinct process I like to go through in terms of identifying the opportunity for a new brand and really taking the time to articulate you know, all the elements of what I call a brand blueprint. So I was so excited when I came on board. And um, yeah, I think where we ended up was definitely kind of ticked all my boxes in terms of it's highly differentiated, it's unique, it has a strong personality, a strong tone of voice. So um, yeah, it was great. So there's, I'm super intrigued because as a marketer, that is incredibly rare where you've literally got a blank canvas mm. and you can be the architect of how it looks, how it feels. And like, was that something that just immediately appealed to you going, this is an incredibly rare opportunity. And just for those that are tuning in, like Athena's only been in market for what, just over two years now? You just had your second birthday? Yes. Yeah. We just turned two. And, and you're one of the fastest growing brands in the Australian market. It's going absolutely bananas out there. So like kudos to you, you've done a lot right. But um, where did Greg join you on the journey? Oh, Greg, Greg took us to a new level um, of oh, Greg. We can reminisce, can't we? I was um, where the stage I had gotten to with the brand was that I had done the brand blueprint and we had got our core proposition, which is pay down your home loan faster. So we had our values. We had the blueprint. We identified the opportunity. But that was it. Like I was like, OK, we now need to do the tone, now, the tone of voice and the personality. And yeah, I had brand, this. The brand hadn't existed. No. At that stage, no. And when I met Greg actually in Waterloo Station in London. Mm -hmm. It just it was serendipity. Like he just happened to be in London the same time I was. Wow. And um, I was like, right, Greg, I need your help. Like I don't want to just do something a little bit different. I need you to come and help me. Like and push me and push all of us as a team because it's so much easier to have someone external come in and go, I'm going to push you to do something really different. What and do you think, Greg? And yeah, and Jono, it, it's great from a marketer, like from Nat's point of view, but also from um, an agency point of view as well, or a creative's point of view, to have a client that's giving you a blank sheet of paper too. And I, I think our biggest issue was, it is great that you have a blank sheet of paper, but people kind of go to their comfort zone and kind of want to project what they think it is. And at the time we had this area of happy homes, which some people in the business felt really comfortable with, but Nat and I kind of went, 
that's not going to cut it. It's just not going to, you know, make a difference. And so for me, what they were saying was we fundamentally want to change the game of home loans. And my job was to make sure they conveyed that because I think a lot of people in business launch with changing the game and disrupting and innovating and they just tell everyone, we're changing the game, we're disrupting, we're di but they actually don't show it, they don't prove it, and they don't act it. And I think that was the big thing we did. And I, I was lucky enough um, uh, to come and do a session. I think that was number eight, but I think by the time I came, there was 12. And we spent a couple of days just deciding who this brand was and, and uh you know, I remember thinking, I, I, I hated the name Athena. I thought it sounded old fashioned. It was Greek. It wasn't Australian. It was, you know, it just felt a bit old fashioned. And after day one, I came back and I said, I, th I think Athena is the game changing goddess of good stuff. And the whole room just yeah. went. Got, I just got tingles then. I've heard it several times, but I yeah, literally but, just got it up my neck. Oh, well, that the, changed everything for us. Because everyone everything. just said, that's who we are. Yeah. Yes. That's who Athena is. And all of a sudden, I liked the name Athena. Once I saw she was a badass kind of, per, uh, like someone just changing the game and giving no fucks. Like mm. that was. And so we kind of developed a tone of voice around that. And from that moment on, I think everyone was really clear that we had a brand that matched the ambition. Yes. Which yes. is totally. And it was a pivotal moment, I think, for our brand, having this game changing goddess of good stuff. I always say, think about if Serena Williams and Beyonce had a baby, it's our game changing goddess of good stuff. Because what actually traditionally happens in a lot of the startups and what was happening with Athena is that the personality of the brand takes on the personality of everyone around the table. So everyone was like, you know, they're, they're real humble lot. They're not like, you know, chest beaty and, you know, and I remember coming on board and the, um, the logo was actually a lowercase. And I was like, we're not here to go, excuse me, do you want a home loan? We are here to change the fucking game. We are here to say we have arrived. So when we had the game changing goddess of good stuff, then Greg said, okay, tell me what her personality traits. And I was like, okay, well, she's not humble. She's not cute. We had lots of cutesy little things in the brand out. It was like, you know, she's got balls. She's had to change the game. She's had to take on the big boys. She's confident. She's empowered. It was a game changer for us as well as a brand. Like... <laughs> I find that so fascinating because when you look back, it's easier to join the dots and see how we've got to where we are right now. But the interesting thing from an agency side, it's usually right at the end of this journey, do you know, and, and you don't have such an amazing archetype, archetype of brand and you don't have the character, you don't have the persona and especially the bold, courageous narrative that you've got going on, that then that fuels the brief for what we're here to achieve as well. Like more often, and Greg, you may find yourself in a similar sort of situation where it's, no, we don't want to look at any of that because that's hard and that's dirty and that's long and it's painful. It's just give us a new ad that's going to change the game for us. And it doesn't work that way, in my opinion. No, these guys set it in stone from the start. And they, you know, the amazing thing about these guys, it's rare that you actually have a product that is fundamentally different. And they, even how they they get their funding was fundamentally fundamentally different and they really were going to do things that no one else did but to then really go to the trouble you know of, of investing in a cmo investing in that from the start because often you get you know the founders kind of put together the brand themselves with some outside people who will just tell them what they want to tell them and they'll buy it but they got nat in and that said we are not going to do anything the same as anyone else and that's why she pulled me in to help with that mm. but but everyone it's it's not like we it was a hard sell wasn't that like everyone no. rallied around it because they, they did. this matches our ambitions and um you know we created our our tone of voice is wonderfully audacious and so just to have a voice that is audacious that and, and the, the rules under that is we cut through the crap, we go there and we're big hearted, I think. Yeah. So, you know, there was a real roadmap of how we speak, how the brand acted. Um, and, 
And people started even talking about the game-changing goddess of good stuff, like in the corridors about that's what she would do. And, you know, we, we spoke about her in the third person. And, um, you know. And we were like, it's not me. Athena made me do it. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Like one of the things that jump out, as soon as you say home loan, like the category is incredibly saturated, it's mature, it's hyper competitive. So is this one of the guiding lights that you had that we need to really say and do something different to just get the attention of the consumer? Partly, yes. So that's again what excited me. Um, home loans was the laggard in financial services to really be disruptive and you know, have some innovation in it. And the fact that everything was so samey, so boring. And, you know, you always hear, uh, oh, you know, you're talking about someone's finances. You got to be conservative. I was like, exactly why we got to go the opposite. But yeah, we had to punch beyond our weight. We had to seem bigger than we are and we had to be confident. And by being edgy, bold, challenger-like, um, achieves all those things. And cut through was one of the major, major objectives. Um. John, one of the, actually in those first two days, we spend about an hour or so talking about what builds trust mm. in 2019, I think it was when we did this. But if you go back 15 years, the most trusted brands in the world were banks, um, uh, insurance companies, and now they are the least trusted. Mm. And the, the problem is when people come into financial services, everyone goes, because we're dealing with people's money, we have to build trust. Mm. So people are quite, well, if we need to create trust, then we have to be very conservative. We have to show people can trust us with their money that we're not going to fall over. And we just went, that is bullshit. I mean, that and I spent a lot of time educating people on these are the most trusted brands in the world right now and they're contemporary. They're mm. honest, they're vulnerable, they swear, they like, and, you know, all these things build trust and our, our biggest issue when we started and we, one of the things we did in those first two days was what is our enemy? What are we fighting against? And the number one enemy was apathy because Australians, once they get the home loan, they go, whoa, that's done. That was hard work, but I've got it now. I'm never going to do that again. And really, if there's a few little percentage points in my home loan difference, I don't, it's not going to really make a difference. People had no idea what the smallest change to their interest rate meant. I was learning on the job with these guys. I didn't think it meant much. When I actually realised how much I was being ripped off um, by the banks and how there's just this kind of, all of Australia is being hoodwinked and we have to shake people out of apathy. So that was our biggest job and we were not going to do that by just playing the same old home loan game. Super interesting. I'm curious to learn what were some of the brands that you looked up to or looked to for inspiration that were, I guess, creating trust with being a bit irreverent and challenging the status quo? Like what was this sample group of brands that you put up on the dartboard and you go, here's where we need to be playing? Um, well, very few in Australia. Yeah. Uh, 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 look, Mozo in the UK is a... Monzo, isn't it? Uh, Monzo, sorry, Monzo. Mm. Monzo in the UK is a really great um, digital financial company um, that really does things differently, has a great tone of voice, um, that juice brand, what was it called again? Oh, it's gone on my head. Juicy as a juice brand, they do lots of irreverent things as yeah, well. But actually, no, at the time, um, one of the things I showed as an example was I don't know if you remember, but a few years ago, there was like a chicken shortage and um, uh, KFC, KFC in the UK, mm -hmm. um was in the world of pain because they couldn't actually serve chicken. And mm. rather than the normal kind of apology and cover up, they did full page ads that took the logo instead of KFC and went FCK. And, and they just kind of said, we fucked up. And mm. full sorry. page ad. And 
it completely flipped. So they were getting, they were being hammered on social media. And as soon as they went out and owned it and said, mm. fuck, everyone just went, God, yeah. like, yeah, it. everyone loved it. And after, after that, they did the bucket campaign. <laughs> <laughs> which was really good and even nike who did the um kaepernick campaign that at first lost them hundreds of thousands of followers and they stood by it and um people started burning their shoes and so nike came and said what if you want to burn our shoes this is how to do it there's examples of that and even like established brands like being able to do it um target or was it kmart did the ship my pants campaign <laughs> So yeah, there was we kind of found more campaigns that were doing. We, yeah, stuff. We, we didn't spend a lot of time in this in this category because we wanted to break the, yeah. Camp, break the category. Yeah, it's really interesting because there's there's a lot of sea of sameness going on everywhere, and mm. as soon as you become more human or you know getting attention is incredibly hard especially in today's environment and you know you've done a phenomenal job of doing it. But I'm curious, what have been some of the biggest challenges you've faced along the journey so far? With marketing in general or marketing um, advertising like what have you found as the biggest <laughs> challenges like nat i'll throw it to you like what have been some of your biggest challenges like even if it's the internal conversation it sounds like you've got you know both nathan and mike incredibly supportive of you and you know very very trusting to to get through what you have got through i think credit to yourself but like <laughs> what have been some of your challenges to date with with brand slash marketing advertising I have been very lucky, you know, Nathan and Michael have been really supportive. Um, there have been a couple along the way in terms of um, one, really getting, I suppose, you know, all our right um, agencies in place, had a few full starts before we found the wonderful DRM, which is just a meeting of minds before we found J-Wing, you know, so um that was a little bit difficult at first. And to find, like, we move really fast. Like, we move at a real pace that some people are just can't keep up with. And I'm not one to be told, that's just not how we do things. I'm like, mm. well, that's kind of how we do things. So <laughs> if you can't keep up, that's fine. We'll go somewhere else. Um, so that that was a little bit tricky. Um, if, I, if I can, from an outsider's point of view, mm. looking in at Matt, I think... Her issues are a little different to others because she did start with a blank sheet and she had yeah. got amazing people around her who really mm. support the vision. I think the biggest issue is how responsive Athena is as a company. Overlay that within a period of two years where there's been seven um, interest rate drops. So Athena drops the interest rate in full immediately more than anyone else. So can you imagine as a marketing team having to respond and dealing with that again and again and again, and then you overlay COVID happened and then their all their criteria changed. And so I think Nat and her team's biggest challenge has been to be so responsive so quickly mm. at a drop of a hat again and again and again mm. At the same time, trying to build a brand <laughs> from ground up as well. So then, I mean, yeah. my view is they're nearly symbiotic because you, you look at what the team has been able to do. And I know the pressure our team faced in those situations as well. And, you know, it was moving mountains in the space of hours, um, which mm. normally should take three, four, five, six weeks. Mm. And let alone the internal challenges there. But right then was you were the most responsive brand in market bar none. Yeah. That, you've taken the lead and everyone's followed and I'd nearly get to the accelerates product as well. Like mm -hmm. you're literally innovating on the fly and mm -hmm. you're helping customers yes. solve bigger problems in an industry that is very, you know, mature. They're very slow. They don't want to do things differently because they're happy with the way things work because they were making a heap of money. Whereas you, and this is where I find the most interesting thing about Athena is the game changing, you know, goddess really, fits into the product that you're delivering you're changing the entire industry but that's where you fueled pr it's where you fueled demand for product it's where customers yeah. are coming to you because they're loving what you're doing like i'm curious just to get your thoughts on, on the product and the innovation that's coming on the fly like how did mm. how did those come about like how did you actually come about with that particular decision going you know what we're just going to drop instantaneously it's never been done before but we'll find a way and i went you know what we should drop immediately and he went 
yes. And he literally walked over to Myra and who's head of product and said, can we drop minutes off the RBA? And she went, yeah, we can. And he was like, Matt, freaking go. And we just went, <laughs> we got like PR release. We got advertising ready. We were like, all ready. It was honestly, we love a rate drop. It's like the drugs that we're addicted to. And um, when we turned it around in like, you know, I think a couple of weeks, we had all the advertising ready. We had outdoor campaigns ready to go up. And then, yeah, the minute that they dropped, we just went press go. It was like, it was amazing. It was so exciting. It's so fascinating because we work with a lot of like other brands that are very established and there's literally like five, six, eight, 12 yeah. stages to a process to get anything signed off. And I'm talking, this can take two or three months for some really basic or simple changes. Yeah. So the speed that they move is so slow. So if results are bad, it takes you like six, 12 months to try Constantly. and turn the ship around. Constantly. Whereas what it, what blows me away with Athena is within a matter of hours, something is just executed and executed well. Mm. Mm. And and that that example of Nat just saying that and that and Nathan goes, yeah, and then can we do it? That happens again and again and again across all levels of the business. I mean, mm. sometimes I might say it and and these guys go, yeah, we should do it, and it happens. Or it's someone from a different department has an idea, and they and they just it it happens within the space of minutes. Totally, yeah. it, that happened with accelerates. Like we were so lucky. Greg was in the country, and Greg happened to be in the office, and I was like, right, Greg, this is what we're thinking. We're thinking about a product where as your hormone drops, your rate drops, and he just went, you should call it accelerates, and we went yes and then i went to nathan he was like i love it went to our devs love it creative and literally we had creatives ready to go up on the website like you know and the afternoon. business makes it happen yeah like, it's so exciting and yeah. and it's just always the guys are always going what can we do to make customers experience better yeah How can we, and you know it's you know, it's not as if there's a, a, a grand plan to go in five years, we're going to be doing this and we'll back. It's like, who's got a great idea? Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I actually think, you know, the question was, what's some of your biggest challenges? I think it's people copying us. And look, yeah. it, it's, it's, um, it's a compliment and it keeps us always changing and being better. But I know, you know, stuff I've written, people now, our competition uses the same phrases. Same colours, same phrases. Same colors and, I actually found a bit annoying. And, <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's like, well, fuck, if all you can do is copy, then go keep copying. We're going to keep <laughs> doing new things. But it's not just in the, in the language and the creative, it's also in the products as well. Mm -hmm. The fact that Athena was the first to instantly drop, now everyone's doing it now because... They have to because Athena, yeah. you know. So Athena has actually changed the game in so many ways already. Mm. But that's what, what I love about it is where you started, like that is in the brand's DNA. All the decision-making process along the way supports it, um, where you've got everyone that's following now and you literally are leading the way. But, I, look, I, I love, you know, I call it unique mechanism, whether it's a product or something that's different that gives you a point of difference. You're just not a brand a different brand with the same product in essence. Mm, yes. Uh, and I think that was really important. It was one of the things as soon as I saw Accelerates, I'm just like, that is just very clever on so many different levels. Yes. We always say that. Nathan likes to say like, we're not lipstick on a piggy bank. So we're not, the brand is not just this shiny marketing thing that I'll just do like good advertising. But when you come and hit our site or experience us, you do, it doesn't live up to the promises. Our brand promise is integrated into everything that we do from customer service to our product proof points. Um, and we use that. It's like, you know, we kind of come back to it and we say, this is our brand rules. Does that fit within our brand? And the answer is no, that we don't do it. Because the other thing I was going to say about culture, culture mm. within the Athena business, like when you actually walk into the, the building, you, it has a different vibe to it to a lot of other brands as well. And it's like the culture has been rewarded for innovative thinking or challenging or throwing ideas around. And you can see it that when a great idea comes to life, it's moved and it's actually brought to reality very fast. Whereas in a lot of other organizations that are risk adverse or they don't want to move the needle that fast, Great ideas are thrown around, I have no doubt. They're just not heard, let alone executed. Do you think 
that plays a big role within Athena that ideas are shared and acknowledged, but more so acted upon by management. 100%. I think one of the great things I always talk about our brand, um, like I mentioned, it's not just a superficial, it's not just owned by marketing. We all here are responsible for the brand. And we spent a lot of time, actually Greg's helped us through the process twice because we just recently refreshed it, taking our brand values and interpreting that for our culture behaviors. And we've been really articulate about what our values mean and behaviors that are acceptable and not acceptable. Um, and now that we're two years old, that like we were all kind of looking at us and going, there's some things here, like our thinking has evolved. And Greg came back in and actually really helped us, like, again, take the essence of our being and match it to the brand, but articulate, well, what are these values that we really want to encapsulate as a business? Do you, like, I simply love that. Greg, do you have an example or something like that you could share or are able to share? Like, I think yeah, that's so, pure genius. I mean, what, one thing, the, the guys, we, we quite often, we did it with the EVP, the employee value proposition. We interviewed all staff first. And so I really got a sense, you know, it was just me in a room with staff and, and not leadership team. So they really felt like they could say, anything but we got a real sense and a truth of of what people wanted and and the employee value proposition um which is freeing people's futures and and what that really worked on both levels for you know you come into athena and your future just opens up and you're and you're you're given the freedom to make your own decisions and and you know like, like the examples we've been talking about but also it related to the benefit of customers as well. We're freeing their financial future. But through that success, everyone felt that the values that were created right at the start, even before I came in, were not probably delivering like the rest of the business was. And so, um, and there was four of them, but I put a structure in place of what is our ambition, our passion and our action so that your values align with your ambition, which is um, break what's broken. So that's Athena's value for ambition. They want to take what's not working and completely fix it and change it, breaking what's broken. And, and, and even, even the language is, is different. It's very um, Athena. Then the passion is lead with heart. Everything they do does come from this genuine love to do something better. Mm -hmm. And, and do it for good. And then the third one, um, which is action, is now's the time. And just even your question, Jono, of it seems to be that things just happen. That comes from, you know, it, it's actually all three. Just that um, action is breaking what's broken. How do we do something better? And then now's the time is the action. Let's let's not wait. Let's, let's get it done. Um, and so... Yeah, they're the, the three the three new values or fresh values we've got. Um, Amazing. I love it. And just in terms of your journey, like I'm curious to learn, how have you used or leveraged research or data or insights to fuel some of these decisions? Mm. When um, I first started, um, particularly to do the brand, I used a lot of research because one of the key components to, I suppose, my brand architecture is that it's anchored in a customer insight. So we all have, especially when you're starting, all have hypotheses around the room around what customer pain points are. And a lot of them are right. But I always say to people, when you go in to do qual customer research, there's always some golden nuggets that come out. So we did a lot to go into the brand part. But then also when we had our CVP, like pay down your home loan faster, I then went back in to prove how many people went. That is really different. Um, and then I did it again before launch because I, of course, you know it's a it's a scary thing as a founder you know this is your baby you've got lots of big investors giving you a lot of money like you can't fuck it up but I wanted to demonstrate that going bold and edgy and different the reaction that you get yes you do get some people going oh like I wouldn't expect that but when you say but would you look them up they're like, yes. And you get a lot of people who kind of go, oh my God, I love it. That's really different. So I wanted everyone to see that reaction to give them comfort with what I wanted to do for launch. So you went through three phases of research and that was all primary research? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Mm. Wow. That but, is mm. unique. But I, 
I think what these guys use research really well in, you know, as a creative, you hate it when they just go, well, let's see what customers think of your creative idea. They don't use it like that. No. Um, but what they do use it for, and, I, and I've been involved in this even the last week, is just does this make sense to you? Does this excite you? And so I've just been working on descriptions of features within a fixed loan <laughs> setting. And, you know, most people will just um, churn that out in a lawyer speak, but, you know, the guy's got me as, as a copywriter to write the kind of legals of the different product features and then, then showed customers to go, does this excite you? Does this make sense to you? Does anything piss you off? Like, so that w w we're continually going at every step of the way from the big ads all the way down to the legal staff, are we talking to people in a way that they want to be spoken to and makes sense to them and excites them? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Greg, because a lot of, you're totally right. Like a lot of people kind of go, let's put creative into research, see if they like it. That's not why I do it. Like, I think it's really important that you're looking for the insights. I'm not looking for people to go, I like it, I hate it. I'm like, well, why? Like you have to kind of uncover. And this is what I, I love marketing because it's the science and the art, right? And, and the psychology of it. And this is where I'm looking for the psychology. I'm like looking for the reactions. And um, yeah, there were times when there was like, you know, three people in the group go, I would never never look you up because I think that is just outrageous um and we were okay with that we were like yeah but look at the majority of people who went oh my god that would stop me in the street so you're not looking for a universal agreement of everyone in the room going yes I love you go forth there's no risk here but I think that's an interesting point as well because you go I've got a cohort that loves and it really resonates and it cuts through I'm okay if 30% of the market totally. don't like our messaging at all and they want to tune out and they think we're the worst thing ever. But that is so important for a challenger brand. I always, always quote um, Eat Big Fish by I think it's John Morgan, but it's a brilliant challenger brand book. And they're like, you cannot, you don't have, you're not going out to get everyone to love you. You're just going out to get your target audience to like you. That's fine. And um, we either want people to love us or hate us. We just don't want to be indifferent. Mm. I mean, I, the classic thing is, you know, since day one, we've said fuck fees on the website. On our website. Fuck fees. You know, who who does that in finance? And you would think, one, that the agent, the client would go out and test, oh, my God, what do people think? They didn't They didn't worry about that. They went, God, if we there's a tsunami of complaints and then we might change it. But in two years, they've had one complaint from a nun who's not in the market to buy home loans. So, and the thing is, you know, everyone would say no fees, but then no one, that's not going to cut through. And everyone says no fees, but there's an asterisk that it says, but when you say fuck fees, that's, that's the, you know, I, everything I wanted people to read made them angry that they were being screwed over. And fuck fees makes your blood boil because you go, yes. And, you know, there's a huge difference between saying no fees and fuck fees. But, yeah, and, and these guys were not worried about upsetting a few people, but one nun got upset. This, this leads me to my next question. So if we look at weapons of influence, so there's 12 neuromarketing principles that influence and persuade human behavior via advertising. The overarching principle across all of them is very, like there's two things that are very congruent. The first is you've got to get attention. If you don't have attention, you can't do anything with it. And the second is it's got to be simple, like so simple, a seven-year-old can understand it. As soon as it's complex, it's the death of any action or any memory formation. So as soon as you go fuck fees, A, you've got attention, and B, you're really resonating. It's a simple message. And more so than that, you, you're eliciting pain within the individual to, to motivate, to, to move as well. But while we're on creative because i know you guys have, have put some interesting ads out in market like i'm nearly curious to learn more about especially like let's look at radio and we'll talk about some of the tvcs that are about to be launched um I, I think any day now but nat can you just talk me through like some of the ads that you have been doing and and why you think they're so powerful <laughs> Yeah. So our radio ads do get a lot of comments. It's, it's called The Call. And it's literally 
um, a customer calling their bank, who we call Beat Bank, um, we just had so many rich ingredients because what we wanted to do is, again, anchor our ads in a truth and a customer pain point. And literally, we have so many. We have, you know, the customers are subjected to rate creep. So customer calls up and goes, where's my rate going up? It's like, well, because you're an existing customer. I'm like, you don't look at it, do you? So there was, it was also such an opportunity to be really funny. We use humor a lot in our ads um, and because it generates cut through and memorability. Um, but yes, we've been using this format for well over a year now. And um, our agency sometimes goes, is this time to do something different? We're like, no, like it's work. we haven't run out of things to say yet. You know, the fact that people feel they have to negotiate every time they call their home loan, you know, it's just ridiculous. The fact that new customers get better rates than existing customers. There are all these pain points that customers go, this is what we hate about the industry. And we want to go, it doesn't have to be this way. So creating some humor out of those pain points and giving the answer, well, Athena doesn't do this, has worked really well for us. I think the other thing that these guys take a punt on but also get excited about is leave room in the recording for the comedians to ad lib. And, it, and and quite often the best stuff has been stuff that the guys just made up. And it's always the edgiest stuff as well. But I think people feel that, you know, you, you can often hear in radio ads, Jono, you would know, you, you can hear the client writing it. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you entertain people and you make them smile and you go, wow, these people are really different, and again, even though it's done through humor, um, it makes your blood boil. You, you kind of go, oh, that makes me mad. Yes, they're like that. Oh, yes, they do that. Oh, my God, I didn't realize they're trying to continually lock me into a longer and longer contract. It's like there, there's several ingredients to it. Like if you boil it down, you've got you're holding up a mirror on the industry and you're going, here's actually what's going on in an entertaining mm. and humorous way. Mm. But you've also got distinction bias or comparison. Here's what they're doing. Here's what we do, which sets you up for success as well. Totally. But the interesting thing, I know when we for, first launched and we trialed radio and it was, it was a bit of a punt and it was a test. And we hadn't spent that much. And I was talking to a few people and they always ask, you know, when you meet people, what clients do you have? Blah, blah, blah. And you rattle them all off. And they're like, oh, Athena, I've heard that's a great ad. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, I'm like, these guys have only been on for a matter of weeks or a few months, yet it was very memorable and it sat there within their, their recall. And I just thought that was just so interesting. Yeah. And I think that's also down to, you know, we've always gone for frequency. Um, and I, I, especially at the moment, going through the launch of this new TVC. And as you know, Jono, I, uh, we share the same passion for surgeon mechanism in, in, in ads, especially direct response ads, like have proof points, have a call to action, um, you know, make sure you, I, you tell customers what you want them to do. Um, and that's true across any medium. So just on that, like this is branding activity, but you've literally got like direct response, call to action throughout everything. Mm, yes, yes. It is one of my non-negotiables. And, and no matter, I mean, honestly, I'm just like, I feel like a broken record because I'm like, don't even, don't even go there with me. I am never not going to have a call to action, but the agency still try. Well, why don't you just take off the URL? You'll have more time. I'm like, there's absolutely no way. They were like, um, but don't you just think people know what to do? I'm like, no, <laughs> it's like tried and tested. If you tell people, what do you want me? What, what do I want you to do next? After seeing the set, I want you to go to the website. I think I believe it's a subconscious thing as well. If you tell people what to do, they're more likely to do it rather than just put something out there and just cross your fingers and hope that they're going to actually do something. So, um, yeah. But Jono, I've, something that you've touched on before, but I don't think clients do enough and you guys together are doing it very well is trialing mm. media yeah. so you 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 said that radio was a punt and it was but you all went let's give it a go mm. and let's see how it works and you you picked a region i think it was melbourne wasn't it and you were like let's let's see how that goes it went gangbusters you rolled it out nationally now it's right at uh, tv, TV. Let's, start daytime. let's you know and oh my god that works and you just build and mm. people don't do that and no, no. Otherwise, you can just keep playing 
treading in the same pond. Oh, totally. And again, this is another thing that is embedded in our culture, you know, constantly, constantly test and learn. And I, I was in interviews with people, but when did you get, when was the last something, time you got something wrong? I'm like, I'm always getting things wrong. You're always making mistakes. Or, you know, we'll test something and be like, oh, that didn't work. But actually, more often than not, we might test something and be great. But every, every learning is a great learning. So, and actually, I now really, um, interview for that aspect you do find some people who are like what if I fail what if it doesn't work I'm like you're not gonna you're not gonna fit in well here you have to not you know we say we we create a bounce positive culture you know come in here fail try things let's see what works Uh, don't be afraid of making a mistake right goes back to I remember sitting in the room with Nathan both in the first time when we put radio forward he's like radio doesn't work it's not gonna work but he's like you know what we'll do it anyway yeah and we had exactly the same thing with TV. His oh, point yeah. was nobody watches TV. And especially with some of the programming we put forward, he's like, seriously, <laughs> yeah. this is the biggest waste of money. I'm happy to be proven wrong. He was not a believer. No, but, he was but that's happy. what I love. But, but he in was a way, happy to test. He's totally happy to test. So, and this is why we kind of say strong views loosely held. Like Nathan epitomizes that because he'll be like, this is what I think I'm going to tell you, but you want to test it, fine. And then once it proves it works, like remember when we wanted to go national and um, dear, I'm like, well, we would actually uh, recommend a slower kind of, you know, filtering out across Australia. And Nathan goes, nope, you showed me it works. Let's go, just do it. So once he sees, he's like, yeah. fine. He's so he doesn't, he's not, you know, you, I've worked with a lot of managers who they kind of stick their heels in because they don't want to be proven wrong or they have a certain subjective opinion, but he's like, nope, that's fine. Go. But it's the personal experience. Like Nathan's like, I don't watch TV and none of my <laughs> cohort do none of my peers. And I'm like, I know, but you hang around quite a select group of individuals and I'm not surprised by that. But if you're using your consumption of media habits to guide your directive of, of strategy, we're in, we're in for some um, troubling waters, but um Indeed. Nat, I know you got to run, but one last question. It's okay. The TVC is about to drop. Yes. What are you most excited by by this pending creative? Oh, it's it's very hard hitting. It's very different. <laughs> I think people. I think the banks are going to go. Oh shit. <laughs> um, I no other financial brand can do this. Like it's um it's so different and it's really interesting how it actually came about and um going back to a point about research at the end of last year um I kind of said okay we need six step back we want to do something different next year I had this whole thing about comparison like you mentioned with our with our call ads you know why it works so well is because it's a clever mechanism to compare Athena to others and I was playing with all these propositions like there's no comparison and this and that and I kind of tried to pull them apart went into some qual research and really all the propositions that I had bombed but everyone went to accelerate and they went tell me more about that you're going to drop my rates as you paid on loan tell me and I was like we are sitting on it the golden nuggets accelerates but the comparison came in I was playing with comparison rate and all this in terms of going why we're different so we had to go you know what the call is right and those ingredients in terms of us and them works but how do we take that and have a different creative concept um, on tv that's as hard hitting but focus on accelerates I love it Greg anything else you want to add I look I, I think you know this is all based around a perfect match and I just think it's the perfect fit for two reasons one is a home loan is a relationship you know when you you are putting all the most money you've ever put out in your life into someone else it is a relationship and it's for a long time you know it's it's going to be shorter with Athena but it's still a long time so it it makes that analogy with a relationship very, very well, but it makes it a choice. And the choice is very clear. You can be with a bank who wants to lock you in for a long, long time and wants to have an abusive one-way relationship, or you can be with someone who wants to be in for a short, for a good time, not a long time, and wants to put you in control of the relationship and I think that's why this concept, I think, is really powerful and will work really, yeah. really. And, and 
have fun with it too. Oh yeah, I mean, we're still going to get complaints, that's for sure. But you can, I'll tell you one more funny story. So at the end of 2019, um, I said to Nathan, um, what was your scariest moment? Thinking it'd be like wet launch or pitching to all these amazing investors. And he was like, the scariest moment was signing off the bondage bus. So at launch, we had buses all around Australia saying, you know, we're not into mortgage bondage. Um, and that took a little bit of convincing. He was like, okay, all right, fine, we'll do it. But he was a little bit nervous. But now when we're doing the TV, he I put a script in front of him he was like not too boring push it now push it I want you to you know I want to get complaints I was like okay fine great (laughs) so he is now like you know he pushes me now which is great (laughs) it's beautiful Um, I'm super excited and a quick shout out or a big shout out to the Royals as well because they've done some phenomenal work as well helping drive this concept and and it's really a team effort so I just want to acknowledge the Royals yeah um, so Mm -hmm. they've done some phenomenal work Nat I know you've got to run Greg thank you so much for your time really appreciate it and I'm super excited for this to drop, which it's uh, it's any day now. So thanks, guys. Over and out. Bye. Bye. Bye.